afternoon and welcome back to Icon 2016. We're broadcasting live from Gallagher Convention Center. Icon 2016, South Africa's longest running comics, gaming and popular culture convention, will be at Gallagher Estate all three days, an amazing array of free activities to choose from. We've got free board games, we have panel discussions, and all of it powered by always on Wi-Fi, super fast Wi-Fi whenever you need it. A reminder about uh, always on Wi-Fi's amazing competition. They have a specially branded sports car in the lobby of Icon 2016, and it needs a name. So head on down to Icon over the course of the weekend, submit your name suggestion for the car, take a photo, hashtag it, and you could be in line to win an amazing array of prizes, including a Suicide Squad hamper jam-packed with goodies. Oh. Now, this particular panel is talking about fiction writing, and to that end, because I know nothing about it, I've brought three particularly special guests on stage. First up, we have from Sarah Blue Publishing, we have Kellen Garrity. Say hello, Karen. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to throw to the... Yep, applause. Applause is most welcome. <laughs> of course. You're all polite people. Nice. I'm yeah. going to throw to the other end of the table, uh, South African published author Dave DeBerg. Hey, everyone. Good to be here. Thanks, man. <laughs> and in the middle, we have some guy. <laughs> 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 Wow. That's quite impressive. We actually had him in makeup for like the last 45 minutes. This is some guy. Yeah, I'm Raymond E. Feist, boy writer. Yeah, Raymond E. Feist, boy writer. <laughs> uh, he's, a, he's a face I think most of you would know. So this particular panel is the first in an initiative that we're trying at ICON. Now that we're streaming panels live, we're going to be having hosted panels at every ICON from this point forward, because now we've set the precedent. Some of the <laughs> Thank you very much. Some of the... <laughs> Thank you. Some of the panels that we want to do is where they're informative and educational. So we'd like to give back to people in the geek culture community, and this is our first one, world building. So what we've asked, we've asked Kellen, we've asked Dave, and we've asked Raymond to come up on stage. We're going to start talking about their tips about what it takes to create an engaging world when it comes to world building. So please just crack open your heads and spill the knowledge now. <sighs> yep, yeah, just start. You come on. Okay. Actually, all right, let's start with, like, um, sorry? It's a bit on the spot. It's like, a bit on the spot. Okay, yeah. let's, <laughs> let's start with some guided questions then. Uh, let's start with Dave. Dave, when you, when you sit down, you wrote Portrayal Shadow, the Mahalian Chronicles, what were you looking at when it came to building your world? What did you start with? Well, it started off with saying that I've, I, I started off reading like the normal kinds of stuff you read, Rich Rich comics and and Archie and Spooky, and I graduated to Famous Five and um, that kind of thing. And then I read Pet Cemetery by Stephen King when I was nine years old. And that's like cracking. You read that when you world. were nine? When I was nine. Yeah, I didn't sleep for two weeks, but <laughs> it was a cool intro, you know? Um, and that changed everything. Mm -hmm. And the first fantasy novel I ever read was um, uh, Porn of Prophecy by David Eddings. And that changed the world again for me because I was sitting there going, okay, I've left like the childish stuff behind and I've been, I opened myself up to sort of adult brutal stuff and now mm -hmm. I've discovered fantasy. Mm -hmm. So when I started playing around with my, with my world, um, it took me about nine or 10 years to get started, but it started with scenes, and as I wrote the scenes, focusing on different characters, the backstory of those scenes and the history of those scenes behind those scenes started building up in my mind. So I created all kinds of different timelines and naming uh, conventions, and I even played around with creating a language, and, but I wasn't getting anywhere. So I thought, well, I need to focus this. And I realized that I need to have a beginning point from where my history begins and that history is going to inform the world building um, and one thing that I and I'd also picked up um, since I began reviewing books and and uh, talking to authors online and everything was that you can't let the world building overshadow your story the story isn't world building world building mm -hmm. informs your story and world building is world building is like the ceiling and the walls and the floor mm -hmm. That's what the world building is. Your story is what happens inside. Right. And um, that's where I began, sort of like 
yeah, just with the small details, building it up, finding a focal point and going from there. Well, Raymond, we've, uh, we've interviewed you for the Release a Geek podcast. You've spoken before about how you developed Midkemia, that it was a combination of the role-playing group scenarios. Yeah, there's a, mm -hmm. a, a lot of different things at the same time uh, occur to me uh, in answering that question. I'm not entirely sure this mic is working. Okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, I should say there were two factors involved, one of which was, was I met folks in college uh, I was a student at UC San Diego, and there was a, a Thursday night group called the Triton Wargaming Society on campus. And most of it was Napoleonic miniatures and revolutionary miniatures and Civil War miniatures. But in the corner, there was this mad bunch of people playing with weird colored polyhedral dice. Um, they were talking about dragons and things, and I thought, okay. And then I got introduced to them, and then I got sucked into the, the, the social aspect. So, so I, I gently got into the gaming environment. So Midkemia was this, uh, as I like to say, uh, uh, an objective virtual world. Uh, and, and nothing benefited me more by the fact that it was all created by anal retentive type A science majors. <clears throat> um, I'm going to tell you one quick story about an argument one day in the kitchen between two of the Actually, the two roommates, John and Steve. Steve Abrams is my gaming partner for years. And we all went to investigate what the brouhaha was. And Steve was arguing that John had sort of gratuitously and frivol you know, frivolously put a volcano in the path of his expedition trying to get from one place to another. And the argument went on for quite a while. So the next week, another one of our players, Dave Guanasso, shows up with this big rolled up piece of paper. And we said, what's that? He says, come into the kitchen and I'll show you. He lays it out. He says, well, after that argument, I, I took the existing outlines of the continents on our map and I projected the tectonic plates. And then I, then I, put, it, then I, would put, them on, I put them on the, chem, uh, the, the biology department computer and I had it print down on the plotter in the physics lab. And yes, there can be a volcano there. <laughs> <laughs> So I guess the point then is the most important aspect of world building is geological accuracy. Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. The most important part is believability. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, you know, you live in a world. You know, you got a three-dimensional real-time example under your feet. Mm -hmm. You know, mountains are there for a reason. You know, rivers go downhill. Um, and by extension, you come up with things like, okay, I love Terry Brooks. He's one of the finest people I've ever met. And once he stopped being bullied by Lester Del Rey, he turned into a hell of a fine writer. But in Sword of Shannara, after Lester got done with it, you know, the main character was living in a, a tavern, an inn, on the frontier. And we're like, you don't build taverns on the frontier. You build them at the busiest intersection you can find. <laughs> People live where they do for specific reasons. People travel where they do for specific reasons. So when you're building your world, you realize, that, as, as Dave said, you're creating this place for characters. You're creating this environment for characters to do things that the reader will find interesting. You know, you're not just you know, showing how much you understand about geological accuracy. Um, so a big part of what should influence your decision should be, well, what kind of story do you want to tell? You know, is it man versus man, man versus himself, or man versus nature? You know, because each one will define your choices and what kind of world you're going to build. Or you're just going to build a place with a lot of cool stuff in it. <laughs> build a place with a lot of cool stuff. I think that's cool. <laughs> Good stuff. Kellen, when, when it comes to shaping a world, there are certain factors like how are you going to handle a magic system? How are you going to handle religion? Is there a process that you go through because you've written Crimson Skies, is there a process that you go through? Is like these are the choices I'm going to make. This is how I'm going to weigh these things up. Have you got a process there? Uh, my process is very much uh, follow the story. So mm -hmm. I take the characters, I take the plot, and I write that. And in writing that, a lot of the world seeps into it. Uh, mm -hmm. I I discover the world as I write, and mm -hmm. I think that that. That's the most authentic way for me. I know that everybody has their own way, mm -hmm. 
Mm. But for me, that works the best, is just to follow the story and discover the story and the world mm. together. I think because of a, a, lot, uh, a lot of budding authors look at something like uh, Tolkien, where Tolkien wrote languages. This is the framework of my world, and they feel that that's what they actually need to do to start even writing. So would all three of you agree then, rather just start writing the story, and everything else can come from that? Sometimes. Sometimes. I think it, it depends on the story that you're writing. Mm -hmm. I, I think that when you start to build a world, very much like when you meet somebody for the first time, you, you have an impression of them. The second time you meet them, your, your idea of them could change. Mm -hmm. And I think that in world building, especially if you're going to start with that, mm -hmm. just know that it could change and that's okay. If your story takes you in a different direction, then let that happen. Don't say, this is what I wrote for the world, mm -hmm. and it has to stay like that. Dave, it, following from that point, how, how many, has it happened to you before where you've come, this is an awesome idea, and it's so going to rock, and it's going to be amazing in here, and then it just doesn't fit? How hard is it from a, from a writing aspect to let that go? It's funny you bring that up, because the, the one thing that really kicked me into into gear with writing Betrayal Shadow was I wrote, I wrote an outline that came to about 30 or 40 pages for the, for the entire first book. I just wrote scene descriptions um, from you know, how characters would progress, the plot, everything, just the entire outline. And I tossed, it, I tossed everything out when I actually sat down to write the book <laughs> because I got to, I got to certain, cer certain situations with the characters and according to the outline, this is where I had to go next. Mm -hmm. And I just realized it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. the, the characters won't make this decision. They won't go in this direction. They won't do this. Mm -hmm. It was very cool in the beginning. Um, and I'm glad I tossed the whole thing out because it would have been extremely stereotypical. Um, it's like one of, one, of the, uh, one of the big new, well, he's a, he's becoming a very big author in the States, is getting quite a following. Michael R. R. Fletcher said a couple of days ago on Facebook that he's tired of, in fantasy specifically, where, and even in sci-fi, where humans are the young race, and they're the troublemakers, and they, <coughs> they do things differently to what the elder races have done. He says, why don't we turn that upside down? Mm -hmm. And it's just a different way of looking at things, and it's something that, that that's the kind of thing you must... You must almost try and keep in mind in, in world building is, for example, you can have two moons in the sky, but you'll need to have some kind of idea of how that's going to affect tides, how that's going to affect weather. Um, you can't just do it because it's pretty. So every choice that you make has to inform the world. It has to make sense, like Raymond says. Mm -hmm. And if, it, if it's not going to help the story, if it's not going to help your characters, or if it's not going to create a space for your characters to do their thing and then get rid of it. Raymond, have you had any examples where you've had to kill your darlings? I'm sorry, my ears just did the, I just got off a jet thing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the, idea of, um, the idea of killing your darlings, these are the things that I'm really holding oh, yeah. dear. What oh, examples have you had for that? Oh, I got, how many, how many hours we got? Um, <laughs> uh, do you guys, you guys ready for a sleepover? Yeah. Okay. Wow. I, okay. okay. The, the the first example that I can think of is that when I when I was involved with the original world building of Bikimia, um, I did the Far Coast, and I did Crydee and and Toulon and and uh, the rest of it, and I went okay, that's cool. And then I thought I'm I got a little arrogant. I said, okay, now I'm going to go off and build the continent on the other side. Now. If you remember the maps uh, in Magician of the kingdom, it's, it's quite a thing, you know, and it's like I did the Far Coast and my friend Steve Abrams, who, by the way, is the South African history crazy, did Natal. And, uh, you know, my friend John Everson did Lamut and Yaban, and then Steve Abrams did down to Crondor along the, the Principality. And then there were a couple of crazy towns, some friends of ours, created that, that didn't make it into the book. And then everything else was, you know, here there be dragons. It was like, okay, that's the eastern kingdom. I mean, that's the eastern 
part of the kingdom, and we know there's a capital called Rillanon. It was all empty. So when I first started writing Magician, and I started in the far coast, well, that was mine. But once I started venturing into other people's turf, I suddenly became terribly self-conscious. And I said, oh. And by killing my darlings, what I was doing was killing their darlings. Because I was saying, I don't care what Steve says about Krondor in the game, because my Krondor is 500 years earlier. So I can make it any bloody damn thing I want, because it's gonna, I'm going to blow it up two or three times before we get to his Krondor. <laughs> Okay, killing your darlings means you have to unshackle yourself. You have to realize that at every moment you're making a decision dramatically that doesn't necessarily have to go where you're going. Now, unlike Dave, I never made the you know, effort to make a 30-page outline. You know, I think partially <laughs> because I've watched guys die over storyboards in making movies where you know, somebody has, you know, writer has killed themselves, they put the storyboard up, and they hire a new director who comes in and goes, no, 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 we're taking that out. And, you know. and again, the director's killing the writer's darlings. What I do is I decide where is the story going to end. Mm -hmm. I have to know what the last scene is. I have to know this is the resolution dramatically I'm going to reach. See, for me, the fun as a writer is I have no idea how I'm going to get there. I've had characters show up out of nowhere. And I'll give you one, two quick examples. The first one was when I wrote uh, Silverthorn. And one of the requests that, that my editor had for the second book was, you know, if you're going to bring Jimmy this hand aboard as, as Squire James, give him a, you know, a contrast. Give him a kid he hangs with who's from noble background. So I came up with Squire Locklear. And Lockie was going to help Jimmy get out of the palace to go find Arutha. And I wrote this line. I said, later that night, two young men cr crept through the underground tunnel, both dressed for travel. And I sat back and literally to myself said aloud, oh, hell, Lockie's going too. <laughs> okay. I needed a diversion, a little bit of business in, the King's, uh, in uh, Prince of the Blood, where Suli Abul and Guru Bule and... Boric were traveling towards the capital of Kesh. And I said, oh, I know, I'll, I'll put some silly stuff in there with a gambler being chased by these three horsemen. And that was the introduction to Nekor di Salani. I could never get rid of that guy after that. <laughs> you know, And that's the beauty of trusting your subconscious, trusting your gut, trusting your instinct. You know. And the beauty of world building is that you give them a playpen. You give them a place to be. The only reason I came up with NACOR was I had a really boring landscape. I had these sort of like rolling hills with nothing in them. So I found something to put in them. Yeah. And I guess that's what I'm saying by killing your darlings, is don't go into the process with preconceived notions. Be, be willing to change. And, and, I, and I do speak from experience when I tell you there are moments when you look at something on, on the word processor, and I go back to typewriters, you know, but you look at the word processor and you go, oh God, I really don't want to hit delete. Hit delete. Mm. Right. How many budding authors, fiction writers, do we actually have in the audience at the moment? Hands up. Show of hands. All right. Oh, so I've got a few people who have come here looking <laughs> for some tips from some published authors. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I think we actually might do for the rest of this panel is we're going to throw to your questions. We're going to ask questions, accept questions from everybody, and we'll then throw it to our panel of experts. So who would like to go first? Hands up. Anybody? Come on, all the budding authors <laughs> that just put their hands up are all good with it. OK, we have a question there right at the front. Two and two, there we go. Are superfluous. They've all got it. All we can all go to the oh. bar and do this. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> good afternoon, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, Hi. So, when it, so when it comes to world building, <laughs> Um, Could you speak up a little bit? I'm a little hard of hearing. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> when it comes to world building, how much time do you spend world building versus plot planning? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, better? Yep, good. <laughs> yeah, well, how much time do you spend plot planning or just plot outlining world building and then the integration on the two? Because a friend and I are actually busy writing together 
I do a lot of the world building and I get lost in the physics and the reality of it where she wants to write off a lot of the things to magic, whereas she wants to do a lot of the plot planning and the two of us come to loggerheads quite often about how to get the two to meet. Um, now obviously this is a two-person process that I'm talking about, but obviously you have this internally to yourselves. What do you do in that situation? What I might do is, uh, I might throw that to Raymond initially because Raymond, you partnered with somebody, you wrote, you wrote this like series had, about I, an empire or something? Yeah, I, I actually have had four collaborators. I, <laughs> I did the three uh, Croner Legacy books too with Joel mm -hmm. Rosenberg and Steve Sterling and Bill Fortune. Okay, I'm gonna use a theatrical analogy for a minute. Okay, you're building sets and she's doing the blocking. Okay, you're gonna define certain things like, okay, I need the character to go from this town to that town. Oh, jolly, you just put a range of mountains between the two of them. So what was gonna be four paragraphs about a quick trip up the road now becomes how they get through the past during the blizzard. So yeah, they will influence each other. But I treat it fairly organically. You know, I was really benefited by having an objective world already built when I started writing Magician. So that when Lord Boric decides that he has to ride to warn the Prince of the Crondor, it's like, oh, we have a mountain range between there, and you can't sail through the Straits of Darkness during the winter, and all of that. That really influences the plotting. Uh, I wrote a thing on Facebook oh, maybe a year or two ago, uh, because somebody asked me about plotting. And my example was tearing down the structure of the movie Captain America Winter Soldier, for a variety of reasons. But one, I figured a lot more people saw that movie than may have read any single book I could reference. And also, breaking down plotting in a book is a very tedious process, whereas breaking down plotting in a movie is actually fairly straightforward. You take every scene and you ask yourself, what does it serve plot-wise? By the way, is there anybody here who's a little vague on the difference between plot and story? What, what, okay. Yeah, so, so the question was, is everybody okay with the idea between the difference between plot and story in your novels? Okay, here's Anybody a, here, like an explanation? Yeah, here's a really quick way to remember yeah. it, and I got this from David Gerald. Um, king dies, queen dies, that's your plot. Queen di king dies, queen dies of a broken heart, that's your story. So y when you're talking plot, you know, make sure you're understanding the difference between plot and story, because you know, I need them to go here and there and the other place and this. Now that's going to directly affect your environment, right? Well, there's also a why they're going here and there and the other place. Um, and that may not directly impact your choices environmentally, but you need to be aware of it. Uh, I would say that, the, the, again, for me it's organic. You know, it's, it's, it's all my stories took place in worlds that I built. You know, I built Kelowan, I built my part of Midkemia, so when I collaborated with Janie Wirtz and I collaborated with Bill and Steve and Joel, you know, it was still, I knew what the environment was. So I really didn't have a lot of sweat about that. I'm going to throw that then to, to Kellen, because your, your answer earlier was, I follow the story, and the story develops, and that helps dictate what is happening in the world. However, I would say that you would have imagined there would be certain points that you would be lost in the world that you're building. Like, how is this happening? How are these things happening? What are the politics like? That sort of thing. So the question of how much time do you spend from one versus the other, how does that work for you? As I said, I follow the story, so it's really when I get to a point in the story where I have to decide does the world affect it here or there, I spend as long as it takes. If it takes me five minutes to figure out, oh, there's a mountain range there, or they use magic here, or mm -hmm. if it takes me a couple of days, it, I just follow my instincts. When you have the answer, you'll, you'll know when you have the answer. Mm -hmm. But specifically about your, your problem, my suggestion would be that the two of you get together, um, each with kind of a point form of mm -hmm. her plot or his plot, sorry, I'm not sure, um, and your world, and you take a turns. You know, she for an hour says, this is the plot, you for an hour say, this is the world, and see where you can kind of merge that together and compromise, where, where things um, clash, see how to work around that because you don't necessarily have to delete something or get rid of something. You can build around that together. So that's, that's my advice for that. Failing that, we suggest deathmatch. <laughs> that <laughs> oh, that could work. That's fine. 
<laughs> Do we have another question? Any other questions? Uh, question over here. We're making Vic run. I don't think. Thanks, no. Vic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your question. Okay, so I've been world building on a world for, okay, it's almost 20 years now. It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but uh, that's actually the main thing that I'm struggling with is I have no idea how to keep all of my ideas congruent and um, manageable. So what do you suggest? Like <laughs> have a giant program with everything on it or just a giant piece of paper or am I overthinking this? <laughs> I'm going to throw this to Dave. Uh, and the reason I'm throwing it to Dave initially is uh, Raymond's already talked about the fact that he was absorbing these worlds and he's built this. So Dave, you were coming, yours, you were coming from yours from scratch in your own mind. How would you address that? My, the way that I did things was I try to focus on the story I want to tell. And I mean, my, my world, I've got a, I've got a, a, a prequel um, that's going to be republished soon that takes place hundreds of thousands of years before the main story <coughs> on a different planet. And that planet has got its own world building. Are you talking about Highlander 2? Please tell me you're not talking about Highlander 2. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, the worst. <laughs> but even even on the, the the even in the place in which Betrayal Shadow takes place, it's also got a millennia of history, um, and there was a lot of world building that I did. But I I had to ask myself, what story am I telling? Where does that story take place, and how does that story affect what I'm trying to build? Um, for example, in 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 my in my world, there hasn't been war. Or any kind of conflict for 500 years. So my cities don't have walls around them because there's no need. Um, <coughs> that kind of thing. Whereas if I told the story about the war before this period of peace, um, there would have been lots of different little kingdoms before this king decided to pull everybody together and fight to create one kingdom and win. And okay, cool, we don't need walls anymore. So I would suggest trying to really focus on what story you want to tell because you'll find out um, that all of your ideas, even though you want to put, you've had some really, really cool ideas and you, you, you think it would be really cool to put them together in one world, you're going you're gonna to come to a point where you're going to be like, okay, this, is, this doesn't work for this world. I can use this somewhere else. I can use this in a prequel. I can use this in, you know, like Brandon Sanderson does where he's got, he's got a, he started with a Mistborn trilogy and now he's writing... Um, centuries and centuries and centuries after that, that first conflict. Um, so focus on what, what the story is, and that'll make the world building come much more easy. It'll, it'll be much more natural to you, and you, you won't be bogged down with all this detail. If I can follow up on yeah. that briefly, um, I'm intuiting from what you said that you're, you're desperate to have this all make sense. Don't! I mean... <laughs> People screw up everything. So, you know, you build this nice little planet, and then you have people go nuts, and they do whatever they do. And if you look at world history, you know, I mean, European history, good example. You know, it's like uh, you, you follow the migration of the Celts from, you know, northern Macedonia, basically, and they end up in Ireland, you know. And they're constantly getting pushed and rules get changing. So what you're doing within a, a narrative is you're basically taking a snapshot of this just very long period of history. And, and a huge part of where you are in that continuum is, is de determined by what your technology is. You know, whether you're looking at something that's, you know, dark ages or probably early renaissance or maybe you got cave people. So... You know, you can start asking yourself questions like, you know, okay, well, okay, well, the crazy religious fanatics are over the hill, and over here we have the rationalists, and of course, because one side is trying to be loyal to their, you know, God the brain eater, and the other ones are trying to understand, you know, how fire really works, they hate each other. Okay. You can get trapped into trying to be too nuanced and too detailed, you know, a coloring book, big, broad outlines, and you color where you need to. When you get to the point in the story where something occurs to you that, oh, I need to like give a little backstory there, then you know, like like she says, following the narrative, following the story, let the story lead you. Uh, Ten years, I think your work is done. 
All right. Uh, Kenan, do you have anything you want to add there? I think Roman's I, referenced <laughs> you, though, so I think you're all good. Well, I just wanted to say <laughs> that um, you don't have to add everything into your story. The fact that you know it is enough. So um, what your characters do should kind of uh, tell the reader a little bit more about it. You don't have to put everything into your story. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do we have another question? Uh, we've actually first hand... Oh, sorry. Vic's already got somebody? Next victim, please stand. Uh, hi. I was just curious to know, um, when you guys are writing a uh, first draft of a new story, how loosely or sort of tight do you write it? Do you... Um, do you sort of write it chronologically, beginning to end, all the way through, or do you bounce around and um, <coughs> write sort of scene pieces and then stitch it together in another run? Or if I'm making any sense? Yeah, both, actually. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'm going to start at page one and write all the way through until I get to the end. Until I get to chapter four and go, oh, hell, I need to go back to chapter two and foreshadow this. Or, oh, I'm making a reference to something that makes zero sense whatsoever. Uh, oh, yeah, I need to move this from here to there. So a lot of it's mix and match. Thank God for word processors, because I remember when you had to do it with scissors and tape. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I literally you know, have those things and then big arrows and writing stuff in the margins that you hope the typesetter can actually read. Uh, yeah, it's organic. It's fluid. It, it's... Uh, Again, beginning and all the messy stuff in the middle that I'm discovering, you know, and yeah, so basically the answer is both. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dave, what would you say? Um, what, why it took me like nine years to build the world for Betrayal's Shadow and for the Mahalian Chronicle was because I, in the beginning, I was, I was a writer who couldn't switch my inner editor off. I would, I would spend a month on one chapter rewriting it, rewriting it, rewriting it until it was perfect. And it got me nowhere. Um, in those nine years, I hadn't finished a single short story or anything. I hadn't finished anything that I'd started writing, and I wrote 120,000 words in nine years. So that, that should give you an idea of how much I jumped around. It was like, oh, idea. Uh, and then I had no idea where I was going with it. And then the new one came, and the new one came, and the new one came. And through that process, I actually <coughs> sort of ended up building the ideas of some of the characters that are in Betrayal Shadow. Um, I had like the first glimpse of Kyber. I had the first glimpse of Bryce um, and his brother, who you'll meet in book two. I had a lot of the character ideas came from these scenes but I didn't have a, a hole to put them into. So now what I do is when, like I'm busy writing the third book now, and I'm just writing it. It's, it's, it's a good bet that 60% of it is going to be a bunch of crap. But the important thing is, is to get it out. You can fix whatever you need to fix afterwards. Mm -hmm. Just write it, get it out, because you're going to fall into the trap if you want to, if you keep on going back and you want to fix something, you want to fix it, make a note of it. Like, like what I do is, is um, I had a, it was actually quite funny, in the first book, I had in one of my <laughs> scenes, there was a carpet in, in a room. And I referenced the culture that created this carpet. And I'd never mentioned them before. And I thought, oh, I'm being so clever. And my editor said, but who are these people? And I was like, I don't have a clue. So I renamed them to somebody I'd actually introduced before. Um, so if I, if I get to a certain point like that in, in, let's say, in book three, where I remember, oh, damn, I need to go back and do this, then I'll make a note in, in the manuscript um, and I'll, so that when, when I do my second <coughs> pass through it, then I, I come up to them like, there it is, okay, boom. Go back to it, fix it up, do everything. Um, but everybody, everybody has their own process. I, got, I found my process through trial and error. Um, mm -hmm. You'll eventually, you'll find your process by writing. Um, that's, that's the only way to do it. Um, Kellen, Kellen, do you have anything to add there? Uh, the first time I wrote a book, it was messy. There were ideas everywhere and uh, chunks here and there and there and there. And at, by the end, I thought all I could do was stitch them all together and it would be perfect. And 
no, that didn't work. It, the stitching was messy. It didn't make sense. There were a lot of cool ideas that just didn't go together. So the second time I wrote a book, I went from beginning to end, and when I didn't know what would happen, I'd write a sentence being like, stuff happens here. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's literally what I did. And um, I went back to it, and I, I kind of found where instead of having to stitch things together, where I just needed to develop it more. And that, for me, worked a lot better than working in pieces. It made more sense for me to go from beginning to end, even if I didn't know all the parts, and add those in later than just try and mash everything together. Uh, I hope that helps somebody. <laughs> if you uh, come to my solo tomorrow, uh, I have a fairly long explanation of like how Magician got written that really addresses your question. Uh, I, that we don't have time for me to take over the rest of this, so I won't. But <laughs> Come tomorrow and, and say the same thing, and I, I think you'll find what I went through uh, illustrative of what they're both saying. So everybody, what uh, Raymond just demonstrated there was a thing called foreshadowing. So yes, be here tomorrow. <laughs> Do we have another question back? Anybody, next question? There's a gentleman over there with a question. There we go. Hi. Sorry, what's your name? Please stand up. What's your name? Hi, my Hi. name is Ruben. Ruben, Ruben Mentor. Um, it is... Many times a writer has many ideas, but stuck with writer's block. So as experienced writers, uh, like, what's your sources of inspiration? And has your personal life experiences or life experiences of people you know influenced your worlds, your characters, and your plots? Like you had an idea of, this is what the character is going to do, then you like heard a story or you had a personal life experience that like changed your story, that gives inspiration to the story. Who wants to take a shot at that? All of the above, <laughs> man. Everything. So We're sponges. Answer, yes. <laughs> We're all sponges. Mm. I don't know a writer who isn't absolutely hooked on trivia, wonders about everything. You know, stuff sticks. You know, something you read in preschool, something that you watched in a movie when you were 12, something you saw on telly last week, it sticks. And I think we all by nature, uh, and writers in particular, are madly curious for why people do the crazy stuff they do. You know, uh, I love villains, because there is no villain in history who thought of him or herself as the bad guy. Every single one of us is the hero of our own life story. Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, they all looked in the mirror and saw a good guy and couldn't understand why so many people were upset with him. <laughs> Sorry, Victor, we have, another, uh, we have a question down the front. Uh, I have a question about going from idea to actually writing the book. Do you... Uh, sit down, no idea, blank page, and just go and see where it takes you? Do you have ideas that linger around? Or do you start writing several stories and see which one works out for you? How do you go from, from having that first thought, and what is that, to actually completing a book on it? Because with the new trilogy, so... Okay, I, uh, not the third one. You know, I don't, I don't waste time <laughs> flailing about. I waste time sitting with a scotch in my hand staring at sunsets. <laughs> um, that's not a waste of time. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> the book I'm currently working on, um, Embers and Steel, book one of The King of Ashes. True story. I woke up one morning three years ago going, who's the King of Ashes? Literally, I, I mean, I don't know where that came from. I may have had a dream that I didn't remember, but the hook was the King of Ashes. So just that question. Uh, ideas come from everywhere. Yeah, what inspires you for the moment, if it fades, it's not a real inspiration. But if it sticks with you and makes you go, well, what is that about? You, know, you start building, building, building. Um, I flailed about a little bit, and again, I'll get into it in detail tomorrow when I talk about the creation of Magician. But one thing that happened early on with Magician uh, was a buddy of mine, Steve Abrams, my gaming partner, I'm saying, well, I'm thinking about writing a story and again, I had no idea I was going to write a novel, let alone 30. I, I was thinking maybe a novella. And he said, hey, why don't you tell the story about how the greater magic came to Midkemia? 
Well, there's the entire Rift War saga right there. So, yeah, it, ideas come from everywhere. Kellen? Uh, the first time I've, I wrote stories, I kind of just picked up a pen, I just picked up paper, and I went for it. And I, I wrote sentence after sentence after sentence saying, what happens next? And I answered all of those questions as I got to it. And as I wrote, I, I kind of saw, oh, this character linked with that. Those ideas came as I wrote. And you'll always look at life, you'll always look at your friends or any situation around you and maybe have more ideas. But I think the, the thing that's going to get you your mo the most ideas is writing. And as you write your story, you're going to find new ideas in that and new ways to link your worlds, your characters, your plot together. Um, but that, that's my, my style of doing it. Uh, I know everybody has their own. Well, it's what Dave said a little while ago. Just write. Yeah. Yeah, like what, one thing that I've that in in my process that I've discovered is, if I have an idea, and I have a title, then I know it's a short story. Mm. Then I sort of jot it down. I've got the name. I, I know everything that happens. It's it's sort of like a I don't know. It's like a fast forward Instagram. I see the images, boom, and I've got everything. Then I'm not worried. Then I then I know I can write that at a later date. But if I get ideas that aren't linked to anything that's like, this is interesting, then I'll write it down and in my <laughs> notebook that I've always got. And next month, I'll go through the notebook again. And if I can't remember <laughs> what that's about, I'll get rid of it. It's, it's like Graham yeah. says, the stuff that sticks is the stuff that you should explore. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Do we have another question? Hand... Uh, Oh, oh, Mike and prepped and ready. Go yeah, ahead. No, I'm ready, Les. Sorry, what was your name? Garth. Garth, right. Your question, Garth. Um, magic and world building. How important is it to have your magic system defined? Are you I'm sorry, could you speak up a little bit? Sorry, is that Thank better? You. Okay, yeah. magic and world building. How important is it for you to have your magic system defined before you start writing your story? So I'll use Brandon Sanderson as an example and Christopher Paolini as an example. When uh, Chris wrote Eragon, he just wrote the story, following from what Kellen said, and he went where he went with the story. But remember, um, he was 15. True. <laughs> um, and then he says, at the end of Inheritance, how difficult it was for him to actually close that story out, because his magic could do anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how would he get Eragon to ultimately try and play at the end? Whereas with Brandon Sanderson and his Mistborn series, it's very structured. You know exactly what his um, magic can and can't do, and he's built uh, Words of Radiance on top of that same world. It's uh, a magic is, is, and it can be one of those traps. It can be a massive trap because magic is almost like world building too. It's magic, especially in fantasy or even in urban fantasy, both inform each other. Um, like you were talking about um, you doing the world building and your writing partner's doing the plotting. If she's handling the magic as well, there could be a magical something that happens that completely changes something in your world building. Um, yeah, so with, with magic, you need to be really conscious of what, of what it does. Like Brandon Sanderson's brilliant at that. Um, I think he's a little too good at it, in my, in my own opinion. Because sometimes uh, the magic, it almost pushes its way to the front of the story for like, a, let's say, a paragraph or two in, in every chapter and then it retreats. Um, where I believe that magic needs to, it needs to flow alongside the story. It's, it's, uh, it's like you've got, I'm, I'm thinking of a river where you've got, uh, you've got a, a leaf and you've got a twig. They all head, they're both heading in the same direction, but different things can happen to them. The leaf might uh, flow over um, or between two rocks where the twig might get stuck between them. So there's, there's, they do different things, um, but they have to work together. And I believe as, as the writer, you should know more about the magic than what the reader or your characters do. You don't have to show everything and define all the rules about the magic system. Um, 
for the reader to understand the magic. Uh, because the reader's on a journey with your characters in your world. And your job at the end is to help them understand the story, including the magic possibly, um, at the end. They don't need to know it from the beginning. So I would say, you know, leave room for it to breathe. Leave some mystery to it. Uh, the important thing is you need to know. Um, but it's not important for the reader at that specific moment to know everything. Um, especially with magic, because magic can really, it can completely tuck over your story. Uh, we, have, we have about two minutes left, so Raymond and Kellen, do you want to add anything to David's comments? Yeah, what he said. <laughs> yeah, okay, um, done. Uh, uh, you, you, you absolutely... Uh, okay, Alan Dean Foster, who I admire greatly, a terrific guy and a great writer, wrote a book called Into the Out Of, and I was asked to read it early thing, and, and I remember getting to a scene about African fetishes, and by the time I had gotten through one scene, I sat back and went, well, Alan really enjoyed his trip to Africa. <laughs> you don't show everything, you just show enough. You, you know, you keep stuff under the hood. But it has to feel organic to the reader. It has to have scale and a sense of balance. Uh, George R. R. Martin has his magic system, which is you know, out there and, ex and extant. But it isn't my magic system where I've got guys throwing balls of fire and blowing up cities and stuff. You know, it's just, it has to feel integrated with the narrative in the proper scale. Kevin? I believe your question was, how much time do you spend on, on the magic and knowing all the answers to it? And I think that when you begin, you should kind of have maybe a couple of of magical things that could happen. Maybe they can fly, maybe this, that, and the other. And you've, you've listed those things, and then you set some boundaries, some rules. What does this allow you to do, and what can't you do with that? And I think just with the, that like basic, just to start out with, and see where you go as you evolve. Just, just as a starting point, don't get too involved. Um, start there and see how you feel after you've answered those simple questions and after you've got the story going. That's it for questions. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time, so I need to actually wrap up. So firstly, I was remiss in actually talking about the uh, sponsor of this particular panel. It's actually Sarah Blue Publishing. Kellen is a uh, publisher at Sarah Blue Publishing. They're currently running a very interesting initiative. If you purchase their latest release, Crimson Skies, it actually stands you in the stead to put a submission forward for Sarah Blue, uh, Sarah Blue Publishing to actually publish. They've put together a prize pack in excess of 100,000 Rand where they will take you through the process of taking your manuscript all the way through to print. So to enter, purchase a copy of Crimson Skies. You can go to sarahblue.com. That's S-E-R-A blue.com. For all the details, purchase a copy. If you have a submission you'd like to put forward, it's going to go through the course of the year, and you actually, actually may stand a chance to win a published book through Sarah Blue. So what I'd like to do now is thank all of our panelists, Dave DeBerg, Raymond Feist, Kellen Garrity. Everybody, please put your hands together. Thank you so much for watching. If you really enjoyed this, please click the like button down below. And if you want all the latest happenings in South African geek culture, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, Geek XP's YouTube channel. The button is just below. Do us a favor. You know you really want to.